Disclaimer. The video is only a representation of what we believe are some tiny issues in El Otto world building. Not a final statement or opinion. World building is an essential component of speculative fiction, regardless of genre. From building huge space empires in military science fiction to arranging a good carnival in urban fantasy, every author must make decisions about what to include in their universe and how to do it. And many will agree that Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is the forefather of modern high fantasy and notably Middle-earth is that one crucial part that has all the attention. That entails a lot of trees, dwarves, elves and elves in trees. But what Lord of the Rings is also known for is its world building, which has been praised for creating a complete world while also being accused for being more interested in the Ents background than the plot itself. So what is that one critical flaw in Tolkien's epic world building? Let's find out right here. As a philologist and scholar of myth, Tolkien paved the way for incorporating rich mythological sagas and folkloric literature into commercially successful genre fiction. In creating one of the most popular works of fantasy, Tolkien also began the process of changing fantasy from a pulpy niche interest to great literature deserving of true critical engagement, a task that succeeding authors completed. However, if you delve further, things grow more complex. For starters, epic fantasy existed in some form before and during Tolkien's period, and it was frequently described as sword and sorcery or adventure. Though Tolkien inspired many imitators, there were other equally popular pioneers like Ursula K. Le Guin and Terry Pratchett, who wrote fantasy in their own unique way. Others, such as Glenn Cook, penned stories that were fundamentally anti-Tolkien in their narrative. Other, more recent authors, such as Stephen Erickson and N.K. Jemisin, have written popular fiction that goes far beyond Tolkien-style stories. Even among famous epic fantasy authors who expressly claim Tolkien as an influence, like as George R. R. Martin and Tad Williams, the emphasis is on deconstructing and re-examining the medieval-style settings in which these novels take place. There are other locations, places and stories gaining popularity. Nonetheless, Tolkien undoubtedly influenced a specific sort of medieval fantasy, which was accompanied by a type of Western mythology. As an enduring work, Lord of the Rings has elicited a wide range of critiques. For example, the first critique that we can delve into is how little of Rings Middle-earth seems to be in the right scale, particularly in terms of population and space. While observing, most people can come up with this particular question like, wait, how many people live here? Of course, we don't need the show to stop and give us a census, but in order to comprehend the stakes of the struggle and what the hero's success or failure can imply, we need to know how huge these areas are, how many people are involved and so on, and the show nearly never expresses any of this effectively. Let's start with the Southlands. The lore is relatively cagey after the first episode about providing us with clear maps and we see snippets of them for early establishing shots, but they're never placed in the context of where the other snippets of map are, making it difficult to keep track of the geographic relations of these places, which we assume is in an effort to disguise some of its reveals, such as the Southlands actually being Mordor, but even without that, it's clear this is supposed to be a big area. It appears to be substantial enough to have a royal dynasty and a traditional kingdom to which Halbrand claims to be the heir, to justify putting someone on the traditional throne. And yet, based on what we see, this entire kingdom comprises two villages, one of which is wrecked and abandoned before the show's action in that area begins. It is guarded by a large garrison of five or six elves, all of whom appear to be concentrated in a single outpost. Three kingdoms, of course, are made up of more than one or two villages. They also include a number of towns and cities, which the Southlands appear to be vacant of. Instead, the political seat of power in the Southlands 
is a small, impoverished community that was supposedly controlled by its butcher before being taken over by its widowed apothecary. The result is a plot centered on saving the Southlands that makes little sense regardless of how you look at it. If these people, Bronwyn can address all of them in one small courtyard, there can't be more than a couple hundred, are all of the Southlands remaining people. The quest to save them failed before the story arrived and it makes it hard for anyone to believe that making Halbrand king of these 200 or so people would change the political or military situation in this part of the world. Alternatively, if there are other large settlements like towns or cities, then it makes no sense that the Numenorians to make a straight route to this village at top speed, or that these villagers recognizing Halbrand as king would in any way be meaningful. For this plot to work, this needed to be a large political and administrative center, which is to say, it needed to be a city. But that's not it. The second interesting critique of Tolkien's work is its racism. The obvious evidence comes from how Tolkien develops the concept of evil and who receives the badge of evil. The orcs of Middle-earth are portrayed as parodies of Tolkien's others, an irredeemable horde of degenerate black beings that execute bad deeds against the fair-skinned, cultured protagonists of his novel. Some opponents argue that this concept of orcs generated using foul procedures contains elements of eugenics and scientific racism. The elves are the most honorable creatures in his planet, as they are the fairest and blondest. The relationship between whiteness and kindness recurs throughout Middle-earth literature. Though the visual representation of movies makes this relationship clear, Tolkien never openly indicates it. In fact, he was offended when it was pointed out to him since he believed he held a strong anti-racist viewpoint. This also has implications for his work's purported moral geography. For example, the flawless ideal world that his protagonists dwell can be found in the northwest of Middle-earth. As we go out, we get to the southwest, where there is Gondor, a complicated country that is still good in the west. As we go further south, we encounter the complex but ultimately malevolent land of Harad, whose dark-skinned people join Sauron in the struggle against the good west. However, in the east, only the most pure of evils can be found in Mordor. Mapping this to the real world provides insight in its own way. The geographical contrast is difficult to overlook when viewed in the backdrop of the orientalizing and demonizing of the East in actual accounts written during the colonial era. Tolkien's own compatriots were pioneers in this activity. Though largely fair, this assessment falls short on a few grounds. For starters, before we look at any allegories in Tolkien's novels, we need to grasp how he saw his work. For him, this was primarily a language project. Unlike most fantasy authors, he did not begin with a story and then build a world around it. It was the opposite way around. He developed an entire language and a universe in which it is spoken. After a lengthy world-building process, he began to compose a narrative set within that realm. Second, anti-racist sentiments are explicitly present in Lothiar, The Hobbit and other works. These stories teach us that innate physical qualities don't matter. The actual heroes of his novel are not the fair noble elves, the immortal wizards or the human countries. The tiny, often overlooked race of hobbits bears the greatest weight and completes the most difficult duties. We could also argue that what appears to be suspicious moral geography is the consequence of Tolkien's work to create a mythopoeia, perhaps an appropriate representation of his viewpoint as a former soldier and subsequently professor in the British Empire's motherland. However, the critique of this worldview extends beyond the scope of the fantasy genre itself. Now we do know that whatever we have mentioned here in terms of the problems of world building when we talk about the Lord of the Rings, it doesn't really take away the quality of work Tolkien has produced. Because world building is something that is related more to the characters of the story 
and how they act in that story rather than the issues themselves. Sure, there can be issues when it comes to a human's writing as we all know about, but on top of everything, Tolkien's work in Elotar is definitely something that not everyone is capable of doing, and that's for sure. But let us know what are your thoughts on that in the comment below. Subscribe to our channel for more such fascinating tales. See you in the next one.